Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another in our uh, monthly town hall uh, series. You know, I'll talk about this later, but it's hard to believe it's now been a year uh, plus that we're dealing with COVID, and I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on a little bit of that in my remarks later. Um, first, I'd like to welcome all of you, and I'd like to thank again Jeremy and Caroline Finkelstein and Catherine and George Masterson, who are chairing our Society for Leading Medicine uh, and for the Society of Leading Medicine for hosting our event today. Uh, as always, we'll have information on that for you at the end of today, and we'd love to have more of you join as members. We've got a really rich uh, uh, set of information today. Um, we had the good news this past weekend of Johnson & Johnson receiving an emergency use authorization. And so we're gonna talk quite a bit about that. Uh, Dr. Sossman's here again to talk with us about those issues. I'll talk in great detail about where we're going with vaccines in the future. Uh, Dr. Drews is online again, as always. Thank you, I'm Dr. Ashley Drews. She does a great job. So she's there for uh, you know real-time answering of your questions that you put in the chat box. And so uh, people have found that to be tremendously useful. And again, thank you, Dr. Drews, for that. We, one of the issues we've seen with COVID is many people with a prolonged recovery and really with long-term uh, symptoms as a result of COVID. And so we've been putting together, as we've talked about before, a recovery clinic. And so we're very happy we'll have Dr. Sandeep Lahodi, one of our gastroenterologists here to talk about that center. Uh, but first, we're gonna start with Dr. Farhan Vahidi. Dr. Vahidi leads this, the, the uh, COVID-19 Surveillance and Outcome Registry. We call it Curator. Uh, and that registry, as he'll talk about, uh, has been keeping track of really everybody we've been testing, everybody we've been vaccinating, everybody who has the disease so that we can look at how we study this disease. Already a number of important publications as a result of that. So Dr. Vahidi, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Bloom, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here uh, to provide an update on, as Dr. Boom said, the Houston Methodist COVID-19 Surveillance and Outcomes Registry, which we call the Curator. Uh, as a highlight um, of this town hall. Uh, so before uh, delving into Curator, um, I would like to take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, why uh, in healthcare poses such a big challenge in utilization of uh, healthcare data. Um, there are several reasons, um, and as this graphic indicates, um, healthcare data tends to reside in multiple uh, siloed locations across large healthcare organizations. Um, and since the data are generated by uh, relatively independent uh, and sometimes non-overlapping uh, processes across a complex healthcare organization, in, in, inherent, in its inherent form, uh, the data structures and the data format are, are non-uniform. Um, in addition to that, uh, the data definitions can vary. Uh, uh, the same data can be called uh, different things based on uh, the, how the data are being utilized. Uh, certain data streams are quite complex, uh, such as waveform data and imaging data, and these data are not amenable to our usual standard uh, data analytic uh, uh, techniques. And finally, there are strict uh, confidentiality and regulatory requirements on healthcare data for, for the purpose of privacy, which is probably more stringent than any other industry. Uh, so the need really is to create a data engine or a data architecture that can deal with this high level of complexity, uh, intake all these data, and provide us with a meaningful and actionable insights. Now, one may ask that what it, what, why does an organization need these insights? And I'll, I'll share with you that I think in the modern day healthcare, these insights are literally um, uh, essential to the survival of an organization. But let's take a look at how uh, these insights were needed in the defense against the COVID-19 at the healthcare system level. Uh, so we needed to scale up the hospital command center. Uh, we needed to predict hospital capacity needs. Uh, we needed to make sure that the disease is not spreading across the healthcare system. We needed to plan for and respond to financial strain. And of course, uh, we needed to lead the global, regional, and local research. Uh, but I think most importantly, all these insights have the ultimate aim of enhancing uh, patient experience and patient outcomes for COVID-19 and for non-COVID-19 patients. And if we look at this paradigm, it is uh, very easy to uh, uh, visualize that these insights and these data needs are not independent of one another. But as I was sharing in my last slide, that the data in itself somehow 
live, lives in silos. So the need really is to create a strong data backbone that is going to support all these insights. And though I'll be talking about Curator, and Curator has primarily been set up as a research uh, data network or a data backbone, uh, but we are, cog we are very cognizant of the fact that uh, the Curator data needs to support all these insights uh, across the healthcare system, um, uh, or at least uh, be congruent uh, across the other insights that are being produced. So um, the story of Curator uh, really starts uh, when the pandemic hit, and it was the need was born out of supporting the clinical and research enterprise uh, across the Houston Methodist, uh, which comprises of our, our physicians, our physician scientists, our trainees, uh, across our eight hospitals, our uh, seven centers for excellence, uh, 20 clinical departments, uh, 20 additional programs and a specialized center, and a vast uh, population health and primary care network. Uh, so at the outset of the pandemic, um, the uh, HMAI leadership uh, established the Retrospective uh, Research Task Force. Um, and it, the charter of the Retrospective Research Task Force was to work in close coordination with the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, uh, to really facilitate observational and outcomes research uh, across the system. And it seems like we have been doing this for a long time, uh, but uh, it's technically less than a year when RRTF was established. And in its first meeting, uh, it identified the need for uh, Curator, which is a unified uh, data source for all observational research related to COVID-19. Because a number of proposals that were being uh, obtained uh, had a requirement for uh, common data elements. So completing this picture, since that time, the RRTF has been uh, evaluating uh, research that comes in for COVID-19. Uh, and um, this uh, falls into uh, five major buckets. Um, the proposals that require further development are, are maybe uh, are not ready for prime time. And then there are proposals that can be completely uh, uh, supported out of Curator. So these uh, outcomes are communicated back to our uh, partners across the system. And then on the other hand, uh, the RRTF may uh, recommend a full IRB review. Uh, it may uh, recommend that an amendment to an existing protocol can be made, or it may recommend that this research can fall under the domain of quality improvement. And in all these cases, an IRB makes the final, uh, final uh, declaration uh, and approval, but the curator data uh, supports the research and really helps in facilitating uh, rapid and valid validated evidence um, synthesis. So I would like to exemplify um, this publication, which is a uh, high impact publication, um, as the metrics uh, indicate over here. Uh, and I would use, that, use this as an example of how a, a strong data backbone and a state of data readiness uh, can really fast track research. Uh, so in the heat of the summer, uh, and when the COVID was uh, resurging across the greater Houston area, um, we uh, started noticing a trend pretty early on, um, and we thought that it would be interesting to uh, uh, evaluate how this second surge is different from the first surge that we saw uh, early, in the, early in the spring. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of this project, but I do want to highlight that we were able to uh, create the first manuscript, complete the analysis within nine days, and then we submitted it for uh, a peer review. And then it came back to us for a revision with a data update, which was again turned around in six days. And then it again, again came back to us for a slight another minor uh, edits and it was turned around. Uh, but all in all, if we look at it from the inception of the idea that we want to look at these phenomena to when it was actually published, it was 64 days of which only 16 days were in-house uh, work for, for this publication. So throughout the course of the year, um, we have contributed uh, several, in several other ways through Curator. And here are some examples of the publications that are already out there in the domain of public health, health systems, health disparities, and additional uh, manuscripts and publications in the domain of critical care and, and ICU research. And uh, I'm very happy to share that uh, the COVID uh, uh, rationale and design manuscript has, been, has now been published in JMIR Medical Informatics Journal. Um, and as the name indicates, uh, this 
publication lays out in detail the reason for having a data resource like Curator, uh, the design strengths um, of Curator, and as well as uh, the, the current metrics uh, for Curator. Um, so in, in, in a brief summary, um, a Curator, we regard Curator as a true big data platform. Um, and if anyone has heard a presentation on big data, they might have heard of these five Vs that, uh, that define what big data are. So in terms of volume, um, just the structured uh, data in Curator is bordering on, on one terabyte, uh, which is a lot of data. And that does not even include our specialized data sources like VICU data, like imaging data. We just looked at VICU data for only 5,000 of our patients, and that is, this, that is six times the structured data, so it's six terabyte in itself. So it's really large volume. In terms of velocity, we have been uh, rapidly gaining more and more data with every passing day. Uh, we have now added a new vaccination cohort. Um, Curator is uh, populated from the back end of our EMR through a process that we call the ETL process. It's a, it's a two-stage ETL process. Uh, it has uh, many uh, nuanced uh, metrics of social determinants of health, of disease severity, and it takes about 18 hours for a Curator data refresh, so that gives you an idea of the volume and velocity. In terms of variety, I've already uh, kind of uh, shared what different kinds of data live in Curator. And veracity and accuracy of data is a continuous process for which we have developed several overlapping uh, procedures. The value I have shared, what it has already uh, produced, and we are very confident that it would continue to contribute uh, in, a, in a very meaningful way as we move forward. So from design-wise, it is a true longitudinal database, which means that it not only has information on patients and tested individuals while they were hospitalized because of their COVID event, but it also has information on what uh, uh, medical information before testing or before hospitalization and after testing or hospitalization. Uh, to, to design robust studies out of curators, curator can provide uh, controls at all levels. And as I shared, we have recently added a vaccination cohort. The flexibility in design also allows curator to be integrated with other uh, data sources. Uh, here is a quick update on a uh, number of patients that we have. Uh, Curator, this is updated for the beginning of this, uh, uh, this week. And it, every, every update is about 48 hours uh, uh, lag. So this is uh, technically end of last week. Uh, but we have uh, 248,618 tested individuals of whom 15%, uh, as can be seen in the red box, uh, were tested positive. Uh, we have hospitalization information for both tested positive and tested negative individuals. And as you can see, about 35% of the tested positive individuals were hospitalized. And th the advantage of having the other side of the picture is if once we design research to find good, valid controls, that's the population that we uh, pull in from. And as I was sharing that this is a longitudinal data resource, uh, so among among all categories of these individuals, we have almost full data on their prior events uh, or prior encounters. And we have very rich data from 60% 60, 60 to 75% of patients, we have data on subsequent encounters as well. And as the time goes on, that, that percent and that proportion of subsequent encounters is going to increase. In terms of vaccinated individuals, Houston Methodist is again leading uh, the effort uh, in our greater community. Uh, we have now data on, again, uh, looking at the end of last week, on about 160,000 individuals who have received at least one uh, dose of the vaccine, of whom about 111,000 have completed both doses. Um, and then we can look at it uh, that among this uh, vaccinated population, approximately 30% at some point in time were tested for COVID-19, of whom 12% uh, were, were positive. Um, and here is a quick list, which uh, I would not read out in a whole lot of detail, um, but it just demonstrates how Curator is supporting uh, very valuable and impactful research across several of our clinical domains, several of centers for excellence like cardiology, neurology, critical care, surgical disciplines, uh, population health, health disparities, uh, pulmonary critical care, and pathology. Um, one of the biggest motivations for developing Curator uh, on our end has been to really shorten the timeline between research discovery and implementation. 
And to this effect, we are uh, developing a front-end interface for Curator, which would provide a seamless web-based interface for investigators to be able to explore data, to plan their research, uh, and uh, ask for data from us, and for us to communicate with the Institutional Review Board or the IRB. I would like to reiterate that Curator is an IRB regulated environment, and we have developed good governance uh, structures around uh, Curator data use. Um, and we really hope uh, that uh, Curator would provide a digital template for the big data and artificial intelligence uh, initiatives that the system is investing in across several uh, clinical domains. Um, in the end, I would like to really thank a number of people, but um, we are short on time. Uh, I'm quickly going to highlight uh, the Center for Outcomes uh, Leadership, along with Dr. Steve Jones, who is the informatics chief, and Charlie Nicholas, uh, who is the infrastructure architect. For me personally, a silver lining in uh, the COVID-19 year is the number of collaborations that I've been able to develop across the institution. And um, this work would not have been possible without uh, tremendous support from Ginny Torno in research technology and her team, especially John Rains, uh, Jay Kumar in health information uh, analytics, especially with our ongoing BD and AI efforts, um, and of course, uh, Billy Askery's team in system quality operations and analytics. Uh, with this, I come to the end of my uh, talk, and I would be happy to answer uh, questions in the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Rahidi. Um, really appreciate that. Um, uh, I was remiss in not pointing out uh, your titles, but I saw they were on the screen there. But I do want to point out that you hold the Conway family uh, centennial chair. And so big thanks and uh, a great impact of, of philanthropy on our institution. Share with us when you came to Houston Methodist. Uh, that's a very interesting qu uh, question, uh, Dr. Boom. I joined Houston Methodist on January 6th, uh, 2020. Um, and uh, we were in an older building and we're in transition to a newer building. So by the time we just kind of settled in into our offices, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was already in, in full effect. Um, so uh, I, I often joke that my experience Huven, H with Houston Methodist is COVID-19, <laughs> uh, but it has been such a tremendous experience. Uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm not new to Houston. Um, I was at, as an, at another institution in Houston, and I think the amount of work, how the team has kind of come together, um, and while going remotely and doing all these innovative things, it's just, uh, it's just tremendous and heartening uh, how, how this all has worked out. And really look forward to the next year and next That's few great. years to take this. Well, forward. you know, one of my favorite sayings, you all have heard me say this before, is chance favors the the prepared mind. It's a, it's a Louis Pasteur quote. So what better than having you here on January 1st of 2020? And, and, and honestly, it's been a theme this past year is all these things we've been built and building and these capabilities we've been building over the last 20 years really coming to head during this. Dr. vahidi has been on my speed dial this year, um, big time. Um, and he and his team have done a tremendous job. Um, I love the fact that I saw in there that, uh, you know, your goal is to improve patient experience and outcomes. That's exactly what we're always about um, as an institution. Um, and uh, uh, your, your team's doing a great job. So thank, thank you. you. So, well, now we're going to talk about uh, the long-term COVID patients. Um, you know, unfortunately, as we've talked about before, you know, many people recover. That's the fortunate part. But unfortunately, many people don't, or many people have a very prolonged course of, of multifactorial, many different systems, many different, uh, uh, across many different specialties, many different organ systems of issues post-COVID. And we don't fully understand understand all of that. Actually, Curator is going to help us understand much more of that over time. I think it's going to be a very, very valuable resource for the country and the world. Um, but we have Dr. Sandeep Lahodi, who is one of our gastroenterologists, who's been very intimately involved in leading our recovery efforts. And he's going to talk to you about that COVID recovery clinic. Dr. Lahodi. Thank you, Dr. Boone. <coughs> it's my pleasure to be here to talk about the Methodist COVID recovery clinic. This is a clinic that we have established to help patients who have residual symptoms after recovery from their acute illness. During this presentation, I will give a high level overview of what symptoms these patients can present with, the structure of our clinic, and what can we offer these patients. So from very early on, we've known that COVID-19 can, after a resolution, leave patients with residual symptoms. One of the first studies uh, came out of Italy uh, in uh, the summer of uh, 2020. Uh, this was a small study that looked at approximately 143 patients. What they did is they had patients that were admitted for less than two weeks and they followed up with these patients two months later. 
And what they found is that a significant number of patients continue to have residual symptoms. And what were these symptoms? You can see on the schematic uh, on the left-hand side are the symptoms that were present at the time of hospitalization. And then on the right-hand side are the symptoms that persisted uh, after discharge. And you can see a lot of these symptoms uh, continue, such as the fatigue, the dyspnea, a joint and chest pain, cough, and various other neurological, cardiovascular, and pulmonary symptoms. After this report, there were numerous other reports that documented this uh, short-term continued uh, symptoms in, in these patients. Well, what about long-term? Uh, this is a recent uh, paper uh, that was just published in Lancet in January of uh, 2021. This is a paper that came out of uh, Wuhan, uh, China, and uh, this is a study of a much larger number of patients, over 1,700 patients. And what they did is they divided their inpatients into three separate groups. Uh, in group one were those patients who did not need oxygen supplementation during their hospitalization. In group two were those patients who needed oxygen via nasal cannula. And group three were those patients who needed uh, oxygenation more intensively, such as mechanical ventilation. And what they found was that across the board, 80% of patients continued to have some residual symptoms six months after discharge. Now, what were these symptoms? Uh, you can see on this uh, the slide here, uh, where these symptoms very much mirror those same symptoms that were present at two months uh, after discharge. In addition, they found that a lot of these patients continue to have pulmonary uh, abnormalities on chest X-ray. 50% at six months continue to have abnormalities. In addition, across the board, 20% of patients continue to have an abnormal uh, walking test, a six minute walking test. The other interesting fact was that a lot of these patients who were sent home with normal renal function, at six months of follow-up, 13% had developed renal dysfunction. So they continue to have damage to their body despite recovery from the acute uh, illness. So we know that Patients who are admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 can have residual symptoms. Well, what about those patients who are treated as an outpatient? So this is a study out of the University of Washington uh, that was also just published in uh, January of this year. And they looked at 150 outpatients uh, that were admitted to their institution. And what they found, if you take I looked right down here is that a significant number of patients, over one third of patients at six months of follow-up continue to have at least one residual symptom. And these symptoms were very much mirrored what we're seeing in those patients who were treated as inpatients. The largest study to date is it's still in preprint form, hasn't quite been printed yet, but this is a survey of over 3,700 patients across 56 countries. Uh, these uh, patients received a questionnaire that was quite extensive. It contained 257 questions. It required nearly 70 minutes to complete. And what they found was that two thirds of patients at uh, six months or longer continue to have symptoms from their uh, COVID-19. 78% of patients continue to have fatigue. 72% of patients continue to have post-exertional uh, uh, difficulty breathing and malaise. And 55% of patients continue to have a cognitive uh, dysfunction, this brain fog that has been described with COVID-19. In addition, besides just the physical aspects of COVID-19, they also documented a severe economic impact. 45% of these patients were requiring a reduced work schedule compared to pre-illness, and 22% had not been able to return to work six months after their illness. So what can we say about COVID-19? Uh, we know that it has devastating impact uh, in the hospital stay. There are people who get strokes, they have MIs, they get uh, DVTs and pulmonary embolises. Unfortunately, this disease continues to have impact even after discharge. While that impact may be not as devastating, it does continue to have a significant impact on their quality of life of these patients and their ability to return to work. <clears throat> so COVID-19 is not just an acute illness. Uh, it has infected over 28 million people here in the United States. And unfortunately, we've had over 500,000 people die from this illness. 
Less publicized has been the significant morbidity uh, that continues uh, that is associated with this illness. Some people view this as a second pandemic, and a lot of these patients have been called long haulers or long COVID or the post-COVID syndrome. The NIH recently gave this uh, syndrome the name the post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2. It's a quite an impressive and scholarly name, but you know, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue, uh, so they've shortened it to PASC. In addition, the NIH has uh, committed one, over a billion dollars over four years to study the syndrome. What are we offering these patients here at Houston Methodist? Well, we have developed a multidisciplinary clinic uh, to help these patients. Uh, phase one rolled out in January of this year where we were treating patients that were discharged from Houston Methodist Hospital. These patients were being seen by our pulmonary doctors, uh, Dr. Uh, George Youssef and Dr. Al Saadi. In addition, they were seen in our uh, continuity clinic under the direction of Dr. Matus and uh, Dr. Colton. In phase two, we started incorporating referrals to specialists. Uh, these were for patients who were both inpatients and outpatients. We're currently in phase three, where we're hiring uh, mid-levels to, uh, to staff our intake clinic. Uh, patients can be scheduled for our clinic via phone or via uh, EPIC referral form. In addition, we have a webpage that is uh, being developed. This is a list of uh, the various uh, subspecialties and the physicians that are involved in our clinic. As you can see, we cover the whole spectrum uh, from uh, pulmonary to cardiology, to endocrine, to nephrology, uh, neurology. In addition, we have uh, physical medicine and rehab involved because these patients do need a lot of OT and PT to recover from possible strokes or cardiovascular effects, and also to try to help these people to return to work. We're currently uh, working to develop counseling services for these people because a lot of them also have anxiety and depression uh, that can occur due to their illness. And as previously mentioned, we are hiring a, a mid-level to hire our, to staff our intake clinic. What do we do in our clinic? Well, the initial visit is a thorough assessment that includes a full spectrum of labs, a chest X-ray, various questionnaires, uh, pulmonary function testing. Uh, further testing and referrals to other specialists as deemed necessary uh, based on the initial evaluation. Uh, Dr. George Youssef has uh, developed a pulmonary rehab program for these patients. Uh, this is both a physical program and can also at some in the future have a virtual component to it. Unfortunately, so far we can only offer these patients symptomatic therapy in terms of trying to control their symptoms. In order to get to helping them to recover fully from their illness, that's going to require research. And this is where Houston Methodist is ideally, ideally situated. We have a tight integration between our physicians, our research, and our infrastructure, with patients being right at the center of this. It is this tight integration that has allowed the formation of certain databases, such as the fabulous curator database that Dr. Vahidi just, just discussed. What are we doing in the Department of Medicine? In terms of um, a research standpoint, uh, these are the various uh, studies that have been conducted by a lot of our uh, physicians. Uh, the, I'm just listing the PIs that are in the Department of Medicine, but a lot of these studies were on inpatients and some of them are transitioning to the outpatient uh, forum. In addition, we have a couple of other interesting studies starting. One is looking at um, Intranasal theophylline. This is being doc uh, done by Dr. Ahmed, our uh, ENT doctor that's involved in the clinic. Uh, a lot of these patients have uh, abnormal smell that, that occurs because of uh, the infection. The theory is that theophylline stimulates the stem cells, allowing uh, regeneration of olfactory uh, receptors. In addition, uh, Dr. Dale Hamilton has a very interesting study looking at mitochondrial dysfunction that can occur in these patients who have uh, prolonged symptoms. Previous studies have shown that with uh, the SARS infection that uh, patients developed mm -hmm. mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. And as we know, SARS-CoV-2 is very much similar to this prior uh, SARS virus. So the theory is that these patients have mitochondrial dysfunction leading to their fatigue and such. Mitochondria are essentially the energy producers uh, of our cells. And as we found out in Texas, when energy producers malfunction, bad things happen. And the same thing happens in our cells. So if we can identify uh, abnormality in mitochondria, we can hopefully also provide them with a the treatment. 
So far, the best treatment for PASC is prevention. And that means continue to socially distance, wear face masks, and get your vaccine. Uh, as we know, vaccines will prevent symptomatic infection in 94 to 95% of uh, people. However, there is some emerging data that may, they may also help in transmission. Uh, there are two studies out of the UK and another one uh, from Israel that have shown that uh, there's a lower chance of getting infected if you have the vaccine. Uh, it can decrease your chances by 80 to 90%. In addition, there's another study out of Israel that has shown a lower viral load if you do get infected. The reason that this is, is important is that we know that the lower the viral load, the lower the chance that you can transmit it to someone else. And also, the lower the viral load that you transmit to someone else, the lower the chance that they'll get a severe infection. <clears throat> So the combination of lowering your chance of getting infected and lowering the viral load reduces the transmission rate. The question is by how much. In addition, we have questions regarding the duration of this effect and what is the effect of, other, of the variance on, on this uh, protection. And keep in mind that these studies were observational studies and not randomized controlled trials. Uh, in addition, these studies are preprints and press releases and not yet ha have not yet been peer reviewed. Nevertheless, there is hope that uh, we can return to some sort of normalcy uh, in the near future. That brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. I, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lahodi. Um, uh, very much appreciate that update. Um, do you have a feel for the longest time you're seeing people in that kind of post-recovery phase? So we have patients that are going out two months uh, after their infection. You know, we are a little bit behind, like for instance, the China data uh, that uh, obviously they were very uh, first in terms of this pandemic. But we have a lot of patients that are six to nine months out from their infection and continue to have symptoms. Yeah, that's, I mean, what, a, what a frustrating thing. And, and you know, I, I've said many times, people don't wanna get this. And um, obviously yeah. so many people do well that many people sort of uh, diminish the symptoms and things, but the reality is um, you can't really predict who's gonna have that, that course. And when I talk yes. to, to patients yes. like that, yes. they are, they're so frustrated and uh, they, they are so impacted for a long time. Well, well thank you for that. I, I didn't realize you were such a good comedian. I did like your, <laughs> when, 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 when energy producers malfunction, no offense to me on the, fun, on the, the thing that hey, bad things happen. Um, I th I'll never think of my mitochondria uh, quite same right, the <laughs> same way again. So, um, well, thank you, Dr. Lahodi. Well, well, now we're gonna move on to Dr. Sossman. Dr. Sossman's gonna update us on uh, the latest in vaccine news and efficacy and uh, talk to us about uh, obviously J&J, &J, which was approved this past weekend. Dr. Sossman. Thank you, Mark. So let's go through uh, the vaccines that have been approved and uh, a couple that are pretty much on the launching pad. Uh, the, uh, the ones that uh, you know about and uh, probably love by now are the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, which uh, really knocked the ball out of the park in clinical trials. Uh, the J&J, &J, which was just recently approved, and then uh, the AstraZeneca and the Novavax vaccines, which will uh, undoubtedly be the, uh, the next two. Uh, the... Uh, Interesting thing that I think we're seeing is, as Dr. Lahodi indicated, increasing, albeit fragmentary, data suggesting that uh, uh, these vaccines do prevent asymptomatic infection. Uh, it's a little unclear whether it's uh, as strong a protection as for symptomatic disease or whether it's a bit weaker. Uh, but it, it, it's becoming apparent that there is clearly an effect. And uh, obviously, if you are asymptomatically infected, you are really probably at really high risk for transmitting the disease because you don't take precautions and you don't stay in bed and so you're out and about. Uh, this is quite consistent with uh, data uh, for these three approved vaccines that were done in uh, non-human primates, where they vaccinated the monkeys and then uh, inoculated their nasal passages with COVID. Uh, and in all cases, uh, these monkeys acquired what is called sterilizing immunity, which means that the virus was unable to live and reproduce uh, in their tissues. So I think we're starting to get uh, 
uh, a pretty good sense that asymptomatic infection and uh, reduction and transmission uh, are going to be reduced by these vaccines, which is fabulous news. I don't think we can take this to the bank quite yet, but uh, as each brick uh, gets added to the wall, it's starting to look very consistent and pretty solid. The uh, AstraZeneca vaccine uh, uh, also seems to have some efficacy here. Uh, we don't know about the Novavax vaccine. In terms of symptomatic infection, uh, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna uh, have the best numbers. The J&J &J is a bit lower. But I think we have, to, we have to remember a few things about this. First of all, if, if, if the J&J &J vaccine, which is 72% uh, effective in the American portion of their clinical trial, if that had been the first one out of the box, everybody would have been dancing in the streets because the FDA's bar for clearing, you know, for efficacy was 50%, about the same as the seasonal flu vaccine. Now, the other interesting thing about the J&J &J data is that it seemed to be a little bit worse in South America and a little bit worse in South Africa, uh, where some of these variants are circulating. But we'll get into that later. The Novavax, which is, and the AstraZeneca is a technology very similar to the J&J. &J. The Novavax is what's called a protein subunit vaccine. Uh, similar to one of the seasonal flu vaccines and uh, seemed in the UK trial to be very effective in an environment where this British variant, the B117, uh, was prevalent. So good news there. Uh, again, a bit uh, less efficacious against the South African variant. Pretty much all of these vaccines have pretty indistinguishable efficacy against severe illness and against hospitalization or death. And that is really, really tremendous news. Um, one thing I do want to caution folks on, when you're trying to compare some of these numbers, the numbers are going to change depending on which subgroup you're looking at. Uh, Numbers in uh, different clinical trials are not going to be comparable because they're done at different times. Different viral variants are going to be circulating in the population, different countries. Um, so I would not really get too crazy about, uh, well, this is, you know, 68% versus 72% or that's 88% versus 90%. The basic message is that these vaccines work really, really well. Uh, the J&J &J is the newest kid on the block, so a couple of specific words about that. It's an adenoviral vector vaccine. Uh, so it uh, uses, instead of the uh, Pfizer and Moderna, which use a lipid nanoparticle to deliver the, uh, the payload to your cells, they use a, a non-replicating uh, adenovirus, uh, and uh, they, they administer DNA instead of messenger RNA, but the DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA once it gets to your cells. So really very, very similar approach, slightly different details. Again, the uh, efficacy in America, which is kind of what I care about, is 72% at preventing symptomatic COVID, very similar against asymptomatic COVID. Uh, and the interesting thing is that as time after vaccination passed, the efficacy against severe disease got better and better and better. So 77% effective at preventing severe disease 14 days after administration, 85% after 28 days, 92% after 42 days. So here's another factor that uh, may or may not be uh, clear when you're comparing, you know, percentages. When was the uh, uh, was the measurement made? So the J and J looks uh, really, really good at preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Maybe not so good at preventing the sniffles, but uh, does that really matter? 
In terms of safety, it seems to, you know, these reactogenic effects, the arm pain, the fevers, the fatigue, maybe a bit less with the J&J &J vaccine. Um, it, uh, there are two cases of severe allergic reactions reported, so no difference there. A little unclear uh, as to which component could be responsible. And if you look at the graphic here, you can see in the, uh, the control group uh, and the vaccinated group, these are people under 65, as time passes, the higher the bar, the higher the level of antibodies. The antibodies go up uh, after a couple of weeks and uh, uh, stay uh, uh, really at a quite high level for as long as they've been measured. And very similar results in patients over 65. Very, very good antibody response. So I think we're very uh, happy and optimistic about this vaccine. And remember, these are results for a single shot. Uh, the, uh, the other two vaccines require two shots. And in fact, J&J &J are doing a trial to see if they need a, or if a second shot would improve the effectiveness uh, even further. But this is a really good vaccine. Real world data, Dr. Dr. Lahodi uh, mentioned some of this uh, in Israel, which is uh, vaccinated a large percentage of the population. Uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, the numbers are very similar to what Pfizer showed in their clinical trial. A great, you know, uh, uh, validation of that clinical trial result. Uh, Scottish Health uh, reduced hospitalization uh, by 85 to 95 uh, percent. Very similar results with uh, real world data in England. And here at Houston Methodist, where uh, the vast majority of our healthcare workers have been, uh, have been vaccinated, the uh, rate of positive COVID tests amongst our healthcare workers has uh, plummeted. It's down on the floor. So the real world data is very, very consistent with the clinical trial data, which is great news. Uh, I won't dwell on safety. Uh, you know, you're not hearing a lot about safety anymore, and that is because there's really not a lot of problems with it. Uh, you have these uh, kind of uh, flu-like effects after the vaccination. Um, not a big deal in almost all cases. There's a very, very low rate of severe allergic reactions, a little bit more than the seasonal flu vaccine, but very, very low. Uh, these are very, very safe vaccines. So kind of what, what does this mean, big picture? And we'll get into this uh, 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 later. Uh, Dr. Boom will talk about it and we'll have a lot of question and answer. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine will probably be uh, approved in a couple of months and then the Novavax. So by summer, there, you know, America is gonna be swimming in vaccines. Uh, the logistics are getting better. Uh, we can, if we act smart and if we uh, get everybody vaccinated and if everybody just hangs tough for a few more months, we can absolutely approach population immunity this summer. Now, that doesn't mean nobody ever gets COVID again, but it means that uh, you can have a pretty normal society without an epidemic. Kids in school, indoor dining, social gatherings, you know, we, we can do this. Well, you know, so the, the proviso there was if all goes well, if everything goes according to plan. So, you know, you have to obviously wonder, well, what could go wrong? Um, the first three of these I don't really actually see are very significant issues. I doubt very much that all three to five uh, major vaccines will encounter major production problems. Likewise, the logistics and delivery of the vaccines is getting better and better. We're up to 2 million shots a day. Uh, there are going to be vaccine refusers, but really uh, what we're seeing is that as people meet or know 
people who have gotten the vaccines and had no difficulties. Uh, the vaccine refuser group gets smaller and smaller. Really, the potential problems of concern are, you know, we let our guard down too soon um, and before everybody is vaccinated and uh, it gets away from us again. And particularly, this opens the door to the proliferation of the viral variants. And it's kind of a race between vaccination and the viral mutations. And if the viral mutations win, we got a big problem. So let me talk about them for a couple of minutes uh, and then I'll finish up. The graphic over here shows the spread of this British variant through the United Kingdom from uh, September to uh, the beginning of December. And look at that curve. I mean, this is, this is the definition of an exponential process. Um, it bubbles along and burns along slowly for a little while, and all of a sudden it explodes. And everybody's like, where did that come from? Well, this is how the math works. All viruses mutate uh, when they're exposed to some kind of selective pressure, like a vaccine. Uh, they evolve. Um, they undergo natural selection. And so the concern is, will they evolve resistance to antibodies, particularly those from the vaccines? And you've heard about the, uh, the California variant, the New York variant, the UK variant, the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant, and they all have these, uh, these very bizarre numbers. And uh, that reflects the fact that nobody quite knows how to classify viruses. And um, this is not say there's not going to be a quiz on this. You don't have to you don't have to remember this. But uh, just as a uh, a nod to uh, fellow techno geeks, uh, this is the evolutionary tree of the coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2. Every time there's a significant change in the virus, it gets a new letter or a new number. Uh, and after, uh, after, five, uh, after it gets five levels down, they give it a, an entirely new uh, beginning. And just in case uh, you find this confusing, uh, don't worry. It doesn't mean that you're dumb. Uh, here is uh, a... Uh, a very expert virologist who's the head of COVID-19 for the World Health Organization. She says, I think all of us are becoming very confused by the different variant names. So don't worry. <clears throat> um, how, uh, how good are the vaccines against these variants? Uh, in plain speak, we really don't know. Um, it appears that the, uh, the UK uh, B117 variant is, is well handled by all of, the, uh, all of the current or near future vaccines. The South African variant is of greater concern. And uh, really, we just don't know how bad this is going to be. Is it going to be a, a moderate problem, a significant problem? Uh, it's, it's clearly, it's clearly going to be a problem. And it may be vaccine specific, but the data is really just not in to, uh, to know for sure. So what about the future? Everybody wants to know uh, when is this going to be over and what kind of world are we going to go back to? So we, we don't know yet how big of a problem the current variants are. And that really is the significant question. Uh, for influenza, uh, we do a new vaccine when the new flu strain is about eight times less sensitive to the old vaccine. And uh, some of the uh, coronavirus variants are approaching that uh, in some studies. We really need more uh, genomic surveillance of the viral variants. Uh, fortunately, that seems to be on the way. The great news is that once we know that we need to do a new vaccine, this can happen very, very expeditiously. Uh, Moderna uh, produced a, uh, a vaccine that will cover the South African variant, they believe, in about six weeks. And the FDA has, uh, has outlined a regulatory pathway that will probably take a few months. 
So I think we're good there. Bottom line, we're probably going to need uh, COVID boosters for the next uh, few years or perhaps perhaps the next 10 years. Um, I think for the next few years during the winter seasonal respiratory virus season, uh, you really are going to be smart if you wear a mask. Um, it'll protect you against the flu for one thing. And COVID is clearly one of its next step of its evolution is going to be a seasonal respiratory virus that's going to predominate during the influenza season. Longer term, it's probably going to become an endemic common cold virus. And we're talking generations or a generation, at least from now. And I'll, I'll bring you back to uh, uh, what is probably, you know, the, the 1918 flu epidemic is probably not the best comparator for the COVID epidemic. This was the, uh, the global pandemic of 1889 to 1890, also called the Asiatic flu. Uh, we, we seem to have a, a, an issue here, uh, which killed about uh, one in a thousand of the world's population. So very, very severe, really bad pandemic. We don't know for sure, but uh, the latest uh, uh, betting is that this was caused by a coronavirus that now circulates in the population and causes the common cold. And that's probably the ultimate destination for SARS-CoV-2. We just have to get to the other side. And, uh, you know, with uh, vaccines and science and smart behavior, we can absolutely do that. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Well, uh I certainly hope we get to the other side quickly. And I think that's going to be one of the themes of my talk uh, right now, which is, uh, you know, we can do this and we can get to that other side. Um, but first, let me let me reflect and acknowledge the fact that um, we are at the one year mark. Actually, um, when I look back a year ago, the day we put together our 24 seven command center, was March 6th. So that will be this weekend that we do that for 365 and now then 366 and counting straight days. Thankfully it's virtual now. It's not quite as much as having, you know, the months we had of, of a 24 seven command center that was physically present for the system. But really um, some pretty amazing numbers. We put together this infographic. We'll be sending out a thank you to all of our staff tomorrow uh, on things that have happened through that, that time. You've seen many of these numbers and um, we're just shy of treating 15,000 inpatients. We'll cross that in the next couple of days. Um, I'll give you an updated number a little later, but 304,000 uh, vaccines. This was produced uh, before yesterday's uh, numbers were in. Um, and very interestingly, 22,000 gallons of uh, hand sanitizer, which is like two truckloads, literally tanker truckloads of this. And so um, it's been a tough year, obviously, for everybody. We've got people who are tired and people who are looking at this next few months and who, you know, can't wait, of course, to see the end of suffering and to get life back to normal um, uh, as we all want to. But think of these frontline health professionals who, uh, for whom life has been even more abnormal and who've had to experience all that loss and all that death and dying and, and suffering um, on the front lines. And again, my heart goes out to all of them. My thanks goes out to all of them. Obviously, the big news this week um, was uh, the mask mandate and some other restrictions being lifted in the state of Texas. Um, lots of people have asked about that. If you go to a Facebook site, there's a quote from, from me in terms of our public statements we've put out about masking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Let me put those in context. Um, this is where we stand at Houston Methodist. So we've come down to you know, roughly 340, 350 patients in the hospital right now for the last few days, you can see the pace is slowing in terms of the decline. And we see the same data really across the United States. Um, and you can see that's a pretty high number still. I mean, we are nowhere out of the woods yet, and we have a very high baseline level of disease. And as I'll show you, very few people um, still who are vaccinated, all that's going to change very rapidly over the next three months. And I'll remind you back in June, in July, I did kind of my five key takeaways in terms of what we need to do to show unity as a population and move forward to defeat this terrible disease. And I'll call your attention to the fifth of those, which was to say that masks are essential and we know that they work and two bullets 
which is unfortunately we as a population have shown ourselves to be incapable without mandates of really having everybody masked to protect each other. Maybe that's changed. I, for one, don't think that has yet. And that I believe masks should be mandatory until we emerge from this. And really, it's only probably another 60 to 90 days that we would need masks to be mandatory. And then we'll see masks. And as Dr. Sossman talked about, there'll be times when we wear them. There'll be certain people who need to wear them, but not in a mandatory everywhere you go, everything you do. And so we're so close. And yet now many people, unfortunately, are probably going to misinterpret some of the signals just as they misinterpreted last May, an opening that actually made sense, but was misinterpreted to say everything's back to normal, let's act willy-nilly. And this was done a week and a half before, well, some spring breaks are this coming week, many spring breaks are the next week. Um, you know, so I shudder to think about, frankly, you know, mass bars, mass dance clubs and things open um, with no masks and everybody packed in and all the things that are going to happen. So we're stealing ourselves, frankly, for another increase. Um, I hope and pray it's not as large as the last increase. I don't think it will be. But, you know, our tired um, uh, people who've been watching this suffering for a year are sitting there right now saying, huh? Um, you know, couldn't we have waited 60 to 90 days, um, really urged mass. So I want to reinforce one of the governor's statements was, you know, he said they're not mandatory. OK, that is what it is now. But he also said they're basically a personal responsibility to care for each other. And I urge everyone to continue wearing a mask, continue to do the safe um, things. And so the key take home message today, you'll see this again at the end, give us 90 to 120 days. Dr. Sossman's alluded to this. You're going to see a bunch of analysis here. Things are going to be way better in 90 to 120 days. There's every reason to believe that unless we have a variant outrace us. And frankly, having more virus out there and more people sick is going to actually handicap us in that race now. Um, but unless that happens or unless people don't take the vaccine, we will be in a much better place in 90 to 120 days. So we've now got that benefit of a whole year at this. And so if you look at the most recent CDC data around causes of death in the United States, this is for the 12 month period of 2019, the usual sort of list in terms of, uh, you know, which ones, you know, went out, um, uh, heart disease, um, about 650, 660,000 Americans die from heart disease and died in 2019, just under 600,000 from cancer. And then it drops off very far to accidents uh, at under 200,000. This is now what we know after 12 months of COVID. Now, these are 2019 heart disease, et cetera, numbers. And then the last 12 months, because I, I can't compare them directly yet, but there's no reason to believe they'll have changed markedly. Solidly, the third cause of death, you know, by a large margin in the United States this past year. Uh, and unfortunately, and I think we could have avoided a lot of this, and I think we can have, we could avoid many more. And unfortunately, I worry about that. And I'll show you some numbers about that. This is the IHME and, you know, not a perfect model. It's one of the models out there, one lots of people look at, but this is their model for deaths in the state of Texas. And you can see the actual numbers there, they, they, they know very well are in red, and then they have kind of uh, not perfect numbers yet up to kind of the dash line where we are. And three scenarios. One is the best case scenario where we kind of did everything right. The other is the most likely scenario. And then up top, if we really kind of let our guards down. And what I'm very concerned about is with a misinterpretation of this mask uh, loosening and some of the other things that were loosened, and we act like we did last May, it's going to look more like the red line or perhaps worse. They haven't projected an even worse, but they, they, this is supposed to be their worst case scenario. When you do the math on the difference in deaths between that dashed red line, the worst case, and then the best case, which is everybody doing the right thing, that's probably a couple thousand Texans dying between now and the beginning of June, um, you know, if these numbers are to be believed. I'm certain it is some large number, unfortunately, if, if we let our guards down and don't uh, get to that point of immunity. So I'm very concerned with where things could go in the next couple months. Um, I don't think we're going to get wildly out of control, um, but I am concerned that we, we could have done much better. And I'm hoping and praying that with all the messaging people are hearing from really every physician, every hospital, you know, of the virtually all businesses um, to say, hey, you know, don't change what you're doing. It's working. Let's get to that point. I'm hoping we do the right things and we look more like that green line even so. 
This is where we are with vaccinations. These are the key tool. And the good news is they've come up dramatically throughout the country. We did take a hit nationally because of the Arctic freeze. So that set everybody behind, um, unfortunately, very little for us um, at Houston Methodist. Uh, a couple of days we didn't vaccinate and then we've been catching up um, since then. And in fact, these are our numbers. Um, as of today, we are over 304,000 vaccines. Um, actually, uh, through sort of quirkiness of how it's distributed in our design not to miss a beat vaccinating. Um, we ended up using uh, some first doses to get to the second doses during that freeze week because they weren't coming in, which means now we don't need to use the second doses. So we're having a pretty prodigious first dose week. In about three weeks, we're going to have to be explaining to the state why we're using most of the first doses for second doses. But it's the right thing to do because we are getting them in arms uh, more quickly. We got a, a note uh, from Epic. Epic is our electronic health record. They have about 70% market share, 60 to 70% with large systems in the country. Um, and they sent us a note. This was at a point where we were at 203,000 and said, hey, we just want to let you know, um, Houston Methodist is number one in our entire database across the country uh, in vaccines administered. And there was somebody breathing down our neck about three, 4,000 behind us, but uh, we were number one in the country. And you can see right now we, we get vaccine, it goes into arms and we are plowing through and getting to many people. And I'll talk about uh, how and who that is in a, in a moment. But I want to explain the rationale for why we do it the way we do it. Um, this is our actual data over the last year, up to a couple days ago, of every individual who has passed away from COVID in one of our hospitals. So in the bars, and this is by decade, except early on, you can see a broader, uh, broader grouping. Um, it's, by, it's over 80 and then 71 to 80, et cetera. Um, that's the, the blue bar is how many people died in that age group. And so you can see it's a very, very large number. The red diamond is what percentage of all deaths are represented by people in that age group. So in other words, if you look at that right hand one, that is 25.6% uh, for the over 80 age group. So one in four people basically who died in our hospitals were over 80. So if you then look at the 70 and up plus the 80 and up, that's essentially 55% of deaths. If you look at the 60 and up, that's 81% of those who died. If you look at 50 and up, that's 94% of those who have died. <clears throat> And so that is the rationale for marching down an age spectrum. We've had a few exceptions to that. We've been very aggressive, obviously, in our transplant population, no matter the age and a couple others. But the vast majority has really been focusing once we got to 1B on marching down an age spectrum and why we've been very vocal, urging the city, the county, others to do the same thing. Uh, and why you'll see uh, some things I'll allude to in a second that will probably uh, continue to move in that direction. And so where are we today? We focused, obviously, on 1A, then we started with the subset of 1B that are 75 and up. Um, we're still getting people sign up that way, but you know, kind of started running out, honestly, and we have an open sign up. So the more sign up, we get them very quickly. Uh, we had moved on to the 65 and up. And again, same thing. Everybody's been invited, invited for quite a while. And uh, on the open sign up, we still get some, but it's diminishing. Uh, and so over the last about 10 days, we have invited 50 to 64 year olds in our database who have health conditions to be scheduled. And I would anticipate that's probably gonna keep us full for the next couple of weeks. And I'll talk about teachers in a second, but towards the end of the month, second half of the month, you're gonna see 1B individuals within our databases continue to get invited down uh, the age tree. Um, we continue to have our open signups. We have many people signing up through that. So we catch them. They attest to the fact that they have a 1B. We don't obviously have that in our database. I think based on conversations with the state, they are likely, now this was before they made the teacher decision, which I'll talk about in a second, but they're likely to start moving into a 1C category by April 1st. And every indication right now, and it makes sense based on the data I just showed you, is the 1C they will authorize will probably be any individual above the age of 50 who wants to be vaccinated. If we got any individual vaccinated across the state of Texas and our numbers are consistent with everyone else, that's over 90% of deaths that we can extinguish within a few weeks once those individuals 
are immune. Yesterday, the state of Texas, this is the email I received around 1230 yesterday from the state of Texas. We will have the sign up uh, ready to go tomorrow on our website. We've got some groups we've been working with and are already getting invited today, but tomorrow there will be an open sign up for anyone who works in pre, you know, it's, it's basically anybody uh, who, who is in a school situation from kids from the age of zero to 18 or to 12th grade. So, um, you know, it's preschool, it's primary and secondary schools and anyone who works there um, at any age. And so um, they will be able to uh, basically go on a separate form. They provide a little bit of documentation, obviously, of where they work and things like that. And we will work hard to get those individuals um, scheduled quickly. It's a pretty big group, so that will probably slow down a little bit some of the getting to younger uh, groups based on what the state decided. Uh, and this is coming from federal guidance, um, but I don't think it's going to change things dramatically. Um, and I'll show you some data around that. Dirk alluded to this. This is the actual numbers of our employees' uh, experience. So in the blue line, that's the number of vaccines we've given. And what you can see is it's well over 40,000 because we have 21,000 some employees who are vaccinated, most of whom are now fully vaccinated, but we're still got a trickle coming in. It's, it's well over 81% of our population of employees. We're working hard to keep moving that up and we will go mandatory sometime probably in June or July. But in orange, what you see is the number of people in our institution, employees who test positive each week. Um, they get it in the community almost exclusively from every analysis we do. They live in the community like everyone else and we have 26,000 plus employees. And you can see in the week between Christmas and New Year's, um, that was almost 1% of our employees. That's how bad things were out there um, that were getting infected at that time period. But look how it has gone down. Now we've gone down 40 to 50% in the city of Houston but we've gone 95% down within our employees. Real world evidence that the vaccine works. It went up a little bit there, but remember one of those was a freeze week. So, you know, I think some of that's noisy data and there's probably a baseline now because we still have, uh, uh, you know, 19% of our employees who haven't been vaccinated at, at this point in time. So let me talk about what it's gonna take to get us to herd immunity. Um, and I've got a bunch of analytics here. Um, and I know this is such a hot topic. I wanted to spend some time with y'all. If you ask people, 40% of Texans, which is kind of in the middle of the pack of states, say, yes, I definitely want a vaccine and I will get it as quickly as possible. So 60% are not saying I'm going to get this as quickly as possible. You can see a couple states there where it can be as high as 60% who are saying yes to this. So we're not uh, kind of in the best shape of any state on this. If you look at how that's changed over time, Time, the good news is it's getting better. So in the dark green, you actually now start to see a few people vaccinated back in January when this last survey came out. But in the lighter green, you see the people saying, yes, I'm getting this really quickly. In the light blue, you see the people who say, well, I'm going to wait a little bit, but I will get it. And so those are, those are changing. And those are mostly flipping people from that. Well, let me wait a little bit into the, I saw my neighbor get this. Yeah, I'll get it. Then you have in orange, the people who say, not sure. Um, that's going down, but not gone down as much as I'd like. And then you see in the red, the people say, I'm not getting a vaccine, I'm never getting a vaccine. And that's gone down a little bit, which is good, but I doubt that's gonna change and that we're gonna change that many minds. So we're gonna be focusing especially on this group in the orange. When you look at this on a demographic basis, it varies quite a bit by age, right? That's logical and, and not I mean, it's not surprising at all, right? People who are older perceive greater risk from COVID. And if they incorrectly perceive a risk from the vaccine, because there really is none, as you've heard, um, you know, they, they do the risk benefit and say, well, you know, COVID's bad, I'm gonna go get vaccinated. And younger people who incorrectly perceive some risk of the vaccine are making a different analysis. What's very concerning is we see very, very big differences by racial and ethnic group, particularly among African-Americans. Um, many, many deep-seated um, historical reasons, that not, not the least of them being the Tuskegee uh, experiments that were done. Actually, Rod Pettigrew, who heads up NMED, uh, wrote a wonderful editorial about that in the Houston Chronicle, I think it was yesterday. Uh, and so I, I, I encourage you to go read that. Um, because we need to get everybody vaccinated. Um, but that is a huge headwind that we face when you talk about equity. Um, yes, there are many, many structural issues that we face, but there are demand and desire and other issues. I'm an optimist. I think we can get through most of these things. And let me show you some data to support that. Um, this is Houston Methodist data of our own employees. Um, basically, every racial group, ethnic group should ultimately hit 100%, right? If we, have, if we vaccinated 100% of our employees, everybody'd be 100% kind of represented at, proportionately. 
But what you saw early on in the red line was that African-Americans were very underrepresented in those who were deciding to be vaccinated. Whites and Asians were very overrepresented. But over time, that has narrowed dramatically. It's not, uh, not everybody's at 100%, but we're getting pretty close. So you're at 91, 92% on African-American, 103% for whites, about 108% for Asians. Um, for Latinx, you are right at 100%. So as we close that 19% gap, um, we'll close this as well. I put that out there because it's very similar for the population. And one of the reasons we pushed so hard to keep pushing through the 65 and up was to make sure we, literally got to every population, every community as best as we possibly could. Uh, and I think we can do this collectively. Lots of reasons people cite for not wanting to get a vaccine. Um, uh, you all have heard all these before from us, but if you look at the top couple here, you know, the first is worrying about side effects. We've gone through that with Dr. Sossman. Stop worrying about it, they're minor. Um, the second is that it's been rushed. These have been so well studied and now 80 million doses given in the United States. Uh, the third is they have harmful ingredients, which is absolutely 100% untrue. That is vaccine misinformation that gets purposely spread. Fear that I'll get COVID from the vaccine is physically impossible. It's not possible, just flat out scientifically, it cannot happen. Fear of needles and injections. I, I smile at that one because let me tell you, if you get COVID and get in the hospital, we're gonna be giving you a lot of needles and injections. Get one or two and you know, if that's really your fear, go get Johnson and Johnson, right? Um, uh, and other things. Here's some good news nationally. This is how many people in each age group have gotten vaccine. So 57% of people over the age of 75 in the United States have actually gotten at least one dose. Now, 27% are done, so they're fully vaccinated, but we're gonna close those gaps quickly. This is really, really good news in terms of the potential extinguishment of death uh, in a relatively quick time frame. But I wanna walk you through a little bit of the analytics, and I'm gonna go a little quickly here, but you're gonna have the data if you really wanna slog through this. Um, remember the R, is basically the spreadability of the vaccine, of the virus. Um, an R naught's the baseline if you don't do anything. An RT is at any given time, and that reflects anything we're doing, whether that's a mask order, physical distancing, a vaccine, anything else that pushes this down. So what you see, one thing I wanna call your attention, if we can keep that R down pretty low, a threshold for herd immunity, which to Dr. Sossman's point, that point where an epidemic starts to not be possible. You'll still have infections, there'll be outbreaks, but there's no epidemic happening. It's only about on an effective basis, maybe one third. It goes down a little if your vaccines aren't as effective. So one of the reasons we're seeing the decline now is by the time you take people who've been sick and people who've been vaccinated, and the fact that we do all these other things to bring that down, you're actually in a pretty good position and that's been helping bring it down. But as you relax those other things and don't have people vaccinated yet, that effective R is gonna go up and the more people we're gonna have to get vaccinated. The native state of this virus is probably two to three. So roughly we need 70% to get there. Some of the variants may be three to four and we may need 80% to get there. So somewhere in that 70 to 80% immunity. Now you can get immunity either through the vaccine or you can get immunity, which may not be as good, but it's still there from being infected. So the population of the US, 332 million, about 260 million people are 16 and up. Remember at 16 and 17, you can get Pfizer. You can't get the other two, but you can get Pfizer. Um, if we figure the people who said, yes, I'm gonna get it, the people who said, I'll get there, and then the people who said, I'm not sure, and you take half of them, you're at about 200 million, just shy of 200 million people. The, her the herd immunity threshold is 232 for 70% and 266. So the bottom line is without having one of two things happen, um, uh, which well, three things, which is convincing a lot more people to get the vaccine, having people who have baseline immunity or getting kids eligible, which isn't gonna happen for a few more months, we can't get fully to that 70%. But with 25, 26% underlying immunity, I think that may be a little higher than the actual. We're getting pretty close. We're probably, I think, in the 20% based on some studies, we don't know that for sure, have some immunity. Um, so we're gonna get close, which means COVID's gonna be way lower. It's not gonna be gone, but it's gonna be way lower. And the good news here is that boatloads of vaccines are coming in, if we believe what's being said. Um, right now, 107 million vaccines have been distributed to states as of today. 
by the end of this month, that's supposed to be, and uh, ignore the 120 for Pfizer, that's now the vial count issue. So if you count it in the way we were counting it, which is 100, that's still 220 million doses of vaccine, 20 of which are a one dose. Um, so there's a ton of vaccines supposed to get distributed this month. And look at the amount of vaccine each of the next few months. If you look at the bottom, the number of people that can immunize, by May, enough vaccines been out there to immunize 270 million. You saw 260 are eligible, so that is why you hear the Biden administration saying there'll be enough vaccine for everybody. Now, I don't think it's gonna be distributed quite that fast. There'll be some delays, you have to get it in arms, and of course you're not immune the second you get it. But nonetheless, that's really great news. And as you look at June and then you look into July, that's more vaccine than there are people in existence in the United States. And that doesn't include the other two that might get approved. So we're, as Dirk said, we're going to be swimming in vaccine um, by this summer. And really by May, anybody who wants vaccine is going to be getting vaccine if we believe this. Now, I did some analytics. I, I geeked out and I spent a whole bunch of time with some spreadsheets. Um, and I'm not going to make you suffer through that. But uh, but just, uh, I guess, trust me, um, I'll be the car salesman. Um, trust me that I kind of did... Uh, a very conservative analysis. I said right now at the end of February, we have just under 8% of people who've gotten both doses. Let's call them fully immune, even though that'll take a little while. We have 15.6% at the end of February have gotten one or two doses. And by the end of, by definition, assuming they get their doses in, in March, they'll all be immune pretty much end of March. And then with very conservative kind of how long does it take to get the vaccines out? takes a good six weeks to be immune, et cetera. In the middle column, you can see by end of May, you've got half the population is immune. I don't mean just getting the shots. They're probably far enough along they're immune. By the end of June, it's 233 million people, 70%. That's more than want it. Um, and so the bottom line is we can get there. And in fact, we have kind of some silly numbers creep into the analysis because there's more vaccine than there are people. Um, and so, you know, you will see the U.S., I assume, starting to basically turn over vaccine supply um, to some other countries in need. In Houston, the vaccine supply keeps going up very significantly. Um, part of that is the gray, which is the FEMA site, but we've gotten a little more. In fact, next week we're getting, this week we've got a kind of bolus for two of the counties. Next week we're getting more at our baseline. Um, everybody is, I think, and that's before J&J &J is just creeping in. Those numbers do not include any J&J. &J. So it's, it's moving. And in fact, when I do an analysis on a Houston basis, and it gets complicated. I'm not going to walk you through every step here, but you're welcome to look at this and, and ask me questions. But we have about 300,000 kids who are probably immune. We have in blue, um, you know, people have already gotten at least one dose, or at least it's here in town. So eventually, very soon, they're going to be uh, immune. And you see the people who want to accept it, and about 769,000 of people who haven't gotten a vaccine yet probably have natural immunity. We're pushing 30%-ish that have some degree of immunity, which is back to that point of why we're seeing some control. This is where we can get to. Um, and that's, you know, you have some children with herd immunity, all the people who say, yes, I want it, get it. All the people who say, I, I'll wait, but I'll get it, get it. About half of eligible adults who say they're not sure, get it. And then you see over to the right, about half of the people who are not sure don't get it. And of course the nevers don't get it, but some of those people, about 250,000 people are immune. We get to within about half a million, 400,000 to 500,000 people of herd immunity. We're not there, but we get there. So we'll creep up if we can convince those not sure people. In fact, we'll get to 70% if we can convince all of the not sure people. To get to 80%, we have to convince all of those people who say, hell no, I'm not getting a vaccine. We're not going to get there. Um, but of course, in that red on the right, we have kids. And so at some point, kids are going to be eligible. And so we're going to want to get our children vaccinated to protect them and to get us to herd immunity. So to wrap things up so we can get to some questions here, um, I've shown you this before. They're safe. They're effective. Uh, wait for your turn. Your turn's coming soon, as I've talked about. Um, please be patient. Um, accept the side effects. They're minor. Take the first one anywhere, anytime. We see them as equivalent from what matters, which is preventing hospitalization, preventing death. Even if one's, let's say, not quite as good by summer, there's going to be so much vaccine around if you then want, and we'll probably have the studies to back this up, if you then want to mix and match and get a second dose or a booster with J&J &J or whatever it is, you'll be able to do that. 
um, and give us 90 to 120 days, wear the masks, they protect you, they protect me, they protect everyone around you. Give us that 90 to 120 days. Now, before we move on to questions, I do wanna show you a quick video. Uh, we actually had a video put together to thank our staff at the one uh, year anniversary, had some uh, patients as well as some, uh, some celebrities in, in Houston uh, do that for us. And so uh, please watch that with us for about three minutes and then we'll be here for questions. Thank you. HTC Kennedy here, and I just wanted to give a big special shout out to the entire staff over at Houston Methodist. We want to thank you guys for all your hard work day in and day out to keep us all healthy and safe during this pandemic. COVID-19 has really taken a toll on all of us, but it's because of you guys working so hard on our front lines that we've been able to get through this together. Thank you again, Houston Methodist. Hi, Houston Methodist family. Captain Tom Gregory, the Airbus Chief Pilot for FedEx Express. I just want to send our heartfelt thanks from Mindy and I to the doctors, nurses, staff, everybody at Houston Methodist for taking such good care of me back in June when I suffered COVID so bad. You saved my life back then. Our heartfelt thanks. I was lucky enough to survive and fly the very first COVID vaccine flight out of Grand Rapids, Michigan to Memphis, Tennessee back on December 13th. I only hope that that flight was able to help save one life. Y'all take care, appreciate all the great support. We love Houston Methodist and the family that you guys are. Hi, my name is Sandy. I had the privilege of being one of your first patients to receive the monoclonal antibody infusion. As a retired nurse, I was so impressed with your optimism and hard work. It is said that Optimism is like a muscle that gets stronger with use. You have done an incredible job on both counts. We are grateful for the incredible job Methodist healthcare systems have done throughout the pandemic on every level. In fact, a friend saw Dr. Boom a couple Saturdays ago administering vaccine. On behalf of myself, my family, and the entire Houston community. We send our heartfelt gratitude and thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Guadalupe Ramirez. I wanted to take this time to thank all the doctors, nurses, emergency responders, and the staff for all that you do. What you do is very important because you save lives. Thank you, Houston Methodist Hospital. Hey, this is Alex Bregman with the Houston Astros. I just wanted to say thank you to Houston Methodist staff for all of your hard work during the pandemic. You guys have been the true heroes and a real inspiration. Thank you for all that you do for Houston and thank you, Houston Methodist. On that nice, that's gonna go out with uh, my monthly president's letter, um, the infographic, uh, basically great thanks to all the wonderful people across our institution who've cared for the citizens of Houston and beyond um, throughout this COVID pandemic. And I appreciate everybody who uh, participated in that video to thank them. So we're gonna move on to some questions now. I'm, I'm gonna warn you, we'll go a little bit late because I want to go uh, get through uh, many of the questions you've been sending. If obviously, if, if you wanna sign off, uh, obviously feel free, but we'll go about 10, 15 minutes late so that we can go and get through those. And Dr. Sossman, I'll cover most of them because they, they look to be vaccine related, but I'll pull in my colleagues if you have any questions for them about some of their activities here. 
I'll have some up on the screen as always, and I also have some that have been coming in uh, through uh, uh, the chat box and, and uh, other mechanisms um, throughout the course here. We're gonna go quickly through some we've covered before. So this is the first one, um, a fundamental question, because here we are in the middle of winter, um, you know, just emerging in, in Houston from winter, but, but not other places yet. And yet it's going down pretty steeply throughout the country. And I think, you know, the, the main thing is the, the, the aggregation of all the right things being done. It is, you know, wearing a mask, physical distancing, et cetera, which brought that R down. And then the fact that we've got some herd immunity or some portion of immunity of people who've been sick, some portion of immunity we're starting to provide through vaccines. And it's the combination of that that has begun to bring things down. But again, if we ease up on the things we've done right, instead of it continuing to come down, it's going to flatten up or even go flatten out or even go up before we actually get more people vaccinated. Remember, if I give you your first dose of Pfizer today, you're not really fully immune for six weeks. And you saw Dr. Sossman's data, if you get the single dose um, of J&J, &J, it's weeks really before you get the highest levels of protection. And so we have a good ways to go, but again, 90 to 120 days, give us that, we'll get there. We got a question about pregnancy. Again, I'll handle this very quickly uh, because the bottom line is the American College of Gynecology <coughs> and the, uh, the Maternal uh, Fetal Medicine Society strongly essentially recommend that pregnant women get the vaccine. It's not fully studied. We'll all, we'll all acknowledge that. But every other vaccine that's not a live vaccine, pretty much every other vaccine is recommended during pregnancy. Women who are pregnant have been at high risk. It has been one of the risk groups who have been ill. Um, you've seen stories here of uh, mothers who have, uh, and we had one mother in the spring who went on to ECMO right after um, delivering her baby, didn't see her baby for weeks, thankfully survived. Um, and um, uh, we have seen some very ill individuals. Uh, it's ultimately obviously a personal choice, but we're strongly encouraging women to consider getting vaccinated uh, at this point. Talk it over with your OB, but all of the OBs are saying the same thing to me when I talk to them. Dr. Sossman, can, a, can taking the vaccine cause you to test positive for COVID later? Uh, no, it, it'll, it'll, you'll have a positive antibody test because that's what the vaccine does, generate antibodies. But the, the antigen test or the molecular test will not turn positive uh, if you've been vaccinated. It's physically impossible. And so kind of kind of like getting the, the, the virus from, from this as well. So a kind of a flip side question, Dr. Sossman, which is if you test positive for the antibodies, should you get the COVID shot? And if so, when should you get that COVID shot? Uh, you should, uh, we, we recommend that uh, people who've had COVID, uh, if you have positive test for antibodies, you still should get the COVID vaccination. Uh, generally, the vaccine gives you much stronger antibodies, uh, much longer duration of antibody protection than you get from, uh, from simply uh, a prior infection. So absolutely you should get the shot and uh, really as soon as you are no longer symptomatic or out of quarantine from having covid uh, you're perfectly eligible to get the vaccine and so we saw obviously the 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 the, the great freeze and i'm sure there's some people out there still um, unfortunately suffering from that and maybe not having their water back etc and our hearts go out to you if that's the case um, but it had an impact, as we saw nationally, on the vaccine distribution. Um, some people are reporting, certainly with other sites, um, some of the, the county and city sites, that it's delayed their second dose. Should they worry about that? What, what, what does that mean for them? Yeah, I, I really don't think it's, uh, it's a serious concern. Uh, the CDC has said that uh, up to six weeks in between shots is perfectly fine. There's some uh, data from the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine in England that uh, three months could be okay. So really, I think if the weather has prevented you from uh, getting the second shot, go ahead and get it as soon as you can, but really don't be concerned that it's going to cause uh, a reduced efficacy. All right. And so a similar question we got asked before, but to put a finer point on, we had the question of somebody who's had antibodies, which by definition means they had the infection at some point prior to that, unless they got the vaccine to cause antibodies. This one says, okay, I've got COVID um, and eventually I may get antibodies, but 
should I get vaccinated? When should I get vaccinated? You touched on that, but, but state that again for Yeah, you're, you, you're eligible to get vaccinated really as soon as you're out of quarantine or no longer symptomatic. Uh, it is certainly possible to wait a bit longer if you want to or if you need to for some other reason, because you're probably protected from uh, getting reinfected for, you know, a, at least a couple of months. But uh, I would basically go ahead and get vaccinated as soon as I was out of quarantine. Yeah. The bottom line is you'll get way more antibodies. So we have every reason to believe it's actually far more protective to have been vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. So it's almost like giving somebody a booster, right? At that point, they've seen it. They made antibody because they saw the vac- the virus because they were sick. And then you're giving them that kind of, you know, spike protein to make antibody again. So so that's raised this question, which is if you've had COVID, should you get both shots? Should you just get one shot? Um, What about that? Well, it's a great question. And as you said, uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, having COVID is kind of like getting getting your priming dose and then getting another uh, shot of vaccine is kind of like getting a booster dose. I don't think anybody's ready quite yet to say, hey, just cut it at one vaccine. Uh, So we're still recommending that people get both shots. Obviously, if you get the J&J, you're only going to get one. Uh, You're going to get a tremendously strong antibody response, which is really going to protect you really well. So uh, I think for the time being, we're recommending go ahead and get both. Follow the normal protocols, yeah. in other words. And so to the second question here, which Dr. Sossman touched on, um, this question of taking only one round of vaccine for anybody who's had, who for anybody for that matter, really is not something currently that we're recommending in, in any setting. Go ahead and get your second dose um, or the one dose, obviously, if you get the one dose. Okay, so um, question here about uh, people getting tested for T-cell immunity if they think they might have had it, but never had a positive antibody test. I- I'm going to jump in here and say the bottom line is everybody should get vaccinated, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of pointless, right? Okay, I mean, it's, an ac- it's kind of an academic exercise in that, hey, did I have it? But it's not really going to change whether we'd recommend that you get vaccinated. Yeah, we, 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 this would be a very, very exceedingly rare indication. I mean, you could imagine people who have, uh, you know, immune suppression, who've been vaccinated, they don't have a positive antibody response. They want to know if they should drop their immune suppression and get vaccinated again, which under the current emergency use authorization is not allowed. But let's say in the future, there's some thought that maybe they should uh, have their cell mediated immunity tested. But I think this might be one in a thousand people. Uh, You should certainly be under the care of a board certified immunologist if you're talking about stuff like this, because this would be a very, very special circumstance. Mm -hmm. So children, I mentioned that, you know, as we saw, there's, you know, one and a half million children or so, uh, 16 and under in the greater Houston area, maybe a couple, 300,000 of them probably are running around with some immunity naturally. But most of the rest are not, and certainly we want to get our our, our younger kids vaccinated. We we got our uh, our youngest, who's 15 now, in the Moderna trial. Um, my wife was very persistent. So we believe in uh, in these, uh, and uh, she's going to help answer that question for people. Um, we don't know yet whether which one she got. Um, but uh, talk about kids and when we might expect that groups of children and what ages might uh, have authorization to get a vaccine. Well, so the Pfizer vaccine is authorized for 16 and up, Moderna for 18 and up, and uh, J&J the same. Um, I will just have to uh, quote uh, St. Anthony Fauci uh, that, uh, you know, high school kids will probably get vaccinated uh, in the fall and elementary school kids probably not until uh, early next year because the clinical trials are ongoing and you know the way this works. You know, they, they just march down the age range in the clinical trials, and it'll take several months, if not a year, till right. we get down to the really young kids. Okay. But, that, you know, it's a pretty good swath of the population. If you think, I mean, it's, it's now zero to 15 or zero, you know, to, to the day before your 16th birthday that you're not eligible for some vaccines. So if you get down to yeah. kind of that 12 to 16 range, that's about a quarter of the children. So if you think about herd immunity, which then would protect all the other children even more, um, if we can get many of those kids uh, vaccinated, it's going to help us a lot with that right. as well.
So, um, okay, so does having received a pneumonia vaccine give any additional protection against the pneumonia that COVID causes? Afraid not. Yeah, I wish it uh, did. It, it can protect you from superimposed bacterial pneumonia if you get in the hospital with COVID, but it doesn't help you against COVID pneumonia. Okay, well, I'm going to give you a, a, a already a biased way of asking the question. <laughs> Is there any valid question? No. Um, younger people could become infertile if they take one of the COVID vaccines. But talk about why is all this stuff out there on the Internet about these vaccines causing infertility? Somehow? Uh, oh, I can't. I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't say why people like to spread all this kind of nonsense and scare others. And uh, it's probably, you know, the Russian Secret Service uh, doing all this stuff. Um, I tell you one thing, there is a valid concern that younger people could become infertile if they get COVID, mm -hmm. uh, because at least for males, uh, having COVID is associated with uh, lack of sperm production in the testicles. Now, whether that lasts forever, we don't know, but certainly uh, during the acute phase of COVID, it's, uh, it's a known fact. Okay, so, you know, there, there's a lot of very organized anti-vaccine approaches out there, and they've seen this as a message that resonates, that scares people, and so they've been using this, quite frankly, and it's, it's utter nonsense, as Dr. Sussman. In fact, you know, I think they've seized on that fact that uh, there's some information about it with the virus and males, and then you seize on that, turn that around, create some misinformation and talk about the vaccine. So please don't let any question about this uh, keep you from getting a vaccine. So here's an interesting one though. Um, uh, we've seen some things from uh, radiological and other societies um, and some recommendations around timing of when should one get a vaccine because you are getting a, you know, an immune shot right here in your arm. <coughs> and if you react to that, you may get lymph nodes under your arm, for example, that, that you know, get a little big. Um, and talk about timing of mammography. Yeah, this is a known fact. And, you know, the way the vaccine works is it, uh, it gets into your muscle cells, it gets into the lymph cells and uh, the lymph nodes that drain the site where the vaccine is given. And it's a known fact that this can cause swelling of uh, the lymph nodes in the, in the armpit, for example. And that area is seen on mammograms and, you know, you can see these big lymph nodes on mammograms. And obviously the concern is, could that be a swollen lymph node from cancer? So certainly if you're, if you're due for your routine mammogram, I would definitely get it before I got my vaccination. We do not recommend that you delay getting your mammogram if you've already had your, your vaccine. The actual prevalence of these swollen lymph nodes is not that big. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like everybody. It's a small percentage of folks. And if a swollen lymph node is seen on the mammogram, all we do is we bring you back in several weeks. We do an ultrasound, uh, you know, no x-rays involved. Do an ultrasound of the axilla. If the lymph nodes have gone away, you can just relax and say, yeah, it was from the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Sossman. And I'll remind everybody, Dr. Sossman is actually a radiologist. So not only is he amazingly expert in all of the other things we've been talking about, but he's particularly expert in, in radiology. So you're getting that uh, from the horse's mouth there for sure. Um, one of the questions that came in uh, uh, through uh, the internet now um, is, are there any studies regarding vaccines and long haul symptoms? So Dr. Lahodi, yeah. since you spoke to those long haulers sure. today, what do we know about that? So uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough data just yet. I mean, the vaccines have just been out for less than two months, so it's hard to really answer this question. But I think this is the type of question that the curator database could ideally answer, the outcomes based. We can look at it in the future and see, you know, of the patients who got vaccinated, how many of them got ill and how many of them continue to have long COVID. So hopefully, you know, four to five months down the road, we may be able to answer this question. Good, but if you have someone with long hauler symptoms, you're not telling them wait to get vaccinated, or no. you st you're still saying get your vaccine, right? Almost yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Last thing you'd want yes. is a reinfection or a variant or something in exactly. an individual like that. But I, I think it'd also be fair to say that uh, yeah. the best way to not have long haul symptoms is to not get the virus. So the vaccine exactly. works really well at doing that, <laughs> right? So, so um, get your vaccine and let's prevent that as well, um, um, for sure. Yeah. So, okay, Dr. Sossman, um, are we ever going to be without masks? 
Oh, I think so. Uh, it's, it's a matter of whether it's going to be a few months or whether it's going to be another year. You know, if we, if we do stupid stuff and we get more surges and we let the variants take hold, it could be, you know, it could be this time next year. If, uh, if all goes well and people are smart, uh, we think it could be, you know, kind of fall. Uh, but yeah. Now, I will tell you that I've been so impressed by the fact there has been absolutely no flu this flu season. None. And what do you think that's because? Because a lot of people got scared straight and got their flu vaccine. Uh, everybody's wearing a mask. Everybody's washing their hands, you know, like a deranged chipmunk. And, uh, you know, I think I'm going to wear a mask next flu season. I can tell you that. Uh, so will we ever be totally without masks? Probably not. But uh, man, the benefits are going to be uh, really yeah, we're going to we're going to see some real cultural changes there, I think, around some of those issues. You know, if you go to the Far East, um, you know, what you will see is um, there's more of a social norm that says, look, if I'm experiencing upper respiratory symptoms, I'm not going to make you sick by going about my daily business as if nothing's changed. I'm gonna wear a mask, I'm gonna protect you. Many people obviously protect themselves in, in major group settings. I think we'll see some of those cultural norms change, but you know, one very key message is gonna be get your flu shot. That was one of the reasons. Another is gonna be, you know, always focus on your hand hygiene, but particularly in the winter flu season. But I agree with Dr. Sossman. I think many people, particularly higher risk people, really need to look in the mirror and think about, you know, why wouldn't I wear a mask in certain settings? It's really not that big a deal. Um, during the height of the flu season, for example. So stay tuned. I'm gonna guess that this summer into fall, we're not gonna be wearing that many masks. I mean, we'll wear some, um, I'm hoping. But again, that depends on what happens over this next 90 to 120 days as we move forward. Um, wiping down things, et cetera, that's part of what we do. But honestly, that's not the main way that COVID's been out there. So um, yeah, wipe down your hands, exactly. So I, I don't wipe down any groceries that I pick up. Um, I, I don't wipe a handle of a door before I touch it. But I, you know, we have hand hygiene stuff everywhere here. If I touch a lot of things, I go walk over and I, I do my hands frequently. I carry hand gel in my pocket every single day. And I mean, every Every single moment and use that tiny little bottle quite a few times a day and that's a very important thing to do um, okay so um, I'm gonna end with this slide but before we get to this slide I want to ask one of the ones that came through um, and that's about stem cells so there's been a lot of information out there about uh, concerns with all of the vaccines but particularly the J&J &J vaccine about them using stem cells that were derived from fetal tissue. Um, and um, there's actually been a lot of guidance that I can talk about also from the Catholic Church and other religious leaders about that. But could you talk a little bit about that, Dr. Sauce? Uh, sure. So the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine have no relationship, contact, or anything else relating to fetal tissue or stem cells or anything like that. They're basically totally artificial. Uh, the <clears throat> the J&J &J vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, both rely on viral vectors. Those viral vectors are, are grown in cell cultures. Uh, those cell cultures are derived from uh, fetal tissue from aborted fetuses from the 1980s. Uh, so a long time ago. Uh, but yes, uh, if, uh, if folks are concerned about that from an ethics point of view, um, uh, though those are the facts. J and J and AstraZeneca both do use uh, fetal tissue in their production process. And so, obviously, if that's of, of particular concern to you, you have two vaccines that really were not uh, in any way, shape, or form derived. There is a test, and, and there's a test that's been used. And I mean, if you're getting COVID, you're having tests that have been used that have a distant uh, connection to some fetal tissue. Um, if you want to read up on this, I, I mean, you can Google this, and I would go to one of the Catholic Church links on this, um, but there's many other sources. Cardinal DiNardo weighed in on this a couple months ago, uh, specifically going through and basically specifically saying it's ethically acceptable for Catholics. I know it's not it's not just a Catholics issue, but saying it's ethically acceptable for Catholics by all means to get the Moderna and Pfizer and actually saying that uh, uh, it's ethically acceptable. In that case, it was AstraZeneca, but the same technology to do so if that's the vaccine that you're available. But uh, obviously, I'd encourage you to go take a look at those uh, that information as well as a source of, of data. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with a couple slides here on kind of the practical side of things, right? 
Um, and my answers to you five days ago would have probably been slightly different than they are today. Um, and, you know, part of my answer is, look, we've got to trust the vaccines. They work. We're seeing that they work. So telling people they can't go about some more normal activities is a wrong message, ultimately, because then we're not trusting the vaccines. But vaccines balanced again what, against what else is happening in the community really is the calculus. And a few days ago, I would have said, hey, you know, it's getting close. Like my parents, I've told them, if you want to go fly, see my brother and his family in April, I'm going to feel real comfortable. You're fully vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the reason I caveat that is because I'm now worried about packed restaurants. I'm worried about 100% capacity in there. I'm worried about everybody crammed in. Uh, I'm worried about sort of selection bias for the looser people or the less careful people all being in there and those being areas that uh, we may see some outbreaks again. So, you know, use your common sense. Um, uh, frequent places that continue to do the right things. Don't support businesses that throw caution to the wind and don't do the right things. They're not looking after you or me as their customer, as their valued customer. The ones who value that long-term relationship with you uh, are going to keep you safe. Um, so, you know, practically we get asked the question a lot, okay, I'm 75 years old, we're fully vaccinated and fully vaccinated means you've gotten both doses or if it's the J&J, &J, you've gotten the first dose and you've waited at least a couple of weeks, probably even a little longer with the J&J. &J. And I wanna get two couples together, everybody meets that or three couples or four couples. I mean, the reality is that's nothing zero risk, but that's gonna be a very safe activity overall. Not zero risk, nothing is, but that makes sense. We trust the vaccine. We move forward in those kinds of circumstances. Travel will loosen up. I will tell you, my family and I have booked a vacation for the end of June, which goodness knows we can use. And we're, that timing has to do a little bit with my daughter's medical school timing. We're counting on the fact that these vaccines will have kicked in. We, we, we will hopefully all be immune, maybe with one exception in my family um, uh, from the vaccines hopefully no exceptions given the, the supply of vaccine, we'll cancel if the number of virus out there and you know if we see problems with variants and other things. But I think we're gonna get to do many more <coughs> things that are much more normal in kind of that time frame. Um, this is that kind of group of 10 seniors getting together. If everybody's vaccinated, they've waited the full time, I think up to about that number, that makes sense. I get nervous when you talk about a large group of people because you know the odds start to catch up with you, right? These are not 100% effective, but certainly that. I've talked to a lot of faith leaders and you know I think uh, our worship services can get to very normal by July or so, but I would urge them to continue to keep uh, you know the precautions in place that 90 to 120 days um, that we're, we're talking about. Um, I mentioned travel, let's talk about overseas travel. The reality is, if you look at places that are going to be the most vaccinated, obviously Israel's way up there. There's a couple other Middle Eastern countries that are way up there, not far behind them. Um, but if you take you know those individual countries out and you talk regions, the EU's not doing as quickly as the U.S. Um, they've been approving things a little slower in general. Although AstraZeneca, you know, they they had different studies, so they approved sooner. Um, I don't think. I, I'm guessing they're not gonna be quite as far as we are. You're gonna be protected. The question's gonna be what environment are you going into? So go study that. There's websites that are gonna tell you, you know, I wanna go to Italy. What's it look like in Italy? And make uh, obviously wise decisions. Um, and then think about the countries that have a active vaccine effort. And there's gonna be many countries. There's a lot of disparity around the world with this that are gonna be nowhere near vaccinated if even having commenced vaccination would not recommend travel to those locations until we get that there. And I think you'll start seeing that change a lot the back half of the year because UK will be done, EU will be done, US will be done. And so the, uh, you know, the vaccine production is going to get concentrated in those other countries. So um, stay tuned. Certainly you can book things and reschedule if you need to book things and reschedule. Um, be smart about it. Use your common sense. With that, um, I'll wrap things up today. I want to thank our co-presenters here, all, all three of you. Thank you for doing a great job today. I want to thank Thank each of you as always for our support. Remember, if you can give us 90 to 120 days, keep wearing your masks, keep physically distancing, keep doing the right things. Use your common sense if you're in the vaccinated group. But remember, most people around you are not going to be vaccinated yet. Um, in fairness to them, let's continue to do the right things. If we do this for 90 to 120 days, we're going to emerge in a much better world or much better country, at least to start with, and ultimately a much better world over the next uh, probably year to two as the rest of the world gets vaccinated. God bless, and we'll see you next month.